what is all this talk about the mark of the beast? I just need somebody to explain it to me or show it to me. Is it in Revelations 13? It seems to me, in view of the political situation in the whole world, that no responsible group can oppose the coming computer revolution. Therefore, it seems to me we have a real one which will continue. Now, I believe that the reports we hear of this revolution are very misleading. They often underestimate the speed which it is going on and the importance. But worst of all, they tend to emphasize the material aspects, how much we will have of this and that, how much leisure, what wonderful new things we will have, and they fail to discuss the impact it will have on our view of ourselves and our world outlook. Many people are attempting to use computers to replace man. I am much more interested myself in using man and machines as a working combination. Thus, the man-machine combination will find a dividing line passing gradually from man over to machine, the machine taking more and more of the burden as we learn how to use the machines as the machines become more powerful. I, I think for me the exciting cyborgs are the one where there's some form of integral enhancement. So there's technology that's integral with the body but it actually gives you abilities that you wouldn't have as a human. In 2002 the implant that I had then was positioned in my nervous system here. Uh, it was a two hour operation and the surgeons fired 100 electrodes into my nervous system to link my nervous system directly with the computer. I mean, partly we had fun with the experimentation and partly from a scientific point of view, actually doing something that nobody has done before is so tremendous. It's, it's the pioneer spirit, you know, nobody's been here before, nobody knows what this feels like till now that is so exciting. But when we start modifying our brains with technology then it does change us from the word go. Even just feeding in one electrode with maybe an extra sense, an ultrasonic sense, which we know is quite possible, then it starts to give you abilities and you believe you can do things outside the normal realms of humanity. So your values, your morals, start to change immediately, you become a cyborg. As that amount increases, so it's not just one electrode you have connected into your brain, it's a hundred or a thousand, so eventually your brain, you and your brain becomes part human, part machine in a true sense, then your morals, your ethics I think would be completely different. I think we're certainly going to get a lot of people who do want to upgrade themselves, no question about that. And there'll be commercial interests and political interests supporting those groups. There's a lot of money to be made here, a lot of power, not just in a military sense, but in an everyday sense, uh, in terms of who gets jobs and who doesn't. I think there's naturally going to be something of a backlash, a, a Luddite type of movement, that says, well, why should you have those things when I haven't got those things? Um, just depends on how much power such people can have and how many people there are with that. But I, I think when implants become more acceptable, as they are becoming bit by bit, so such people, the, the humanists that want to stay human, the, the Terrans maybe, as Hugo would call them, uh, they, I, I can't see them ultimately having much power because at the end of the day their intellectual capabilities will be so inferior to cyborgs, those that have implants and upgrades, that the cyborgs will be able to outthink the subspecies that still are human. I think now we look at the body in a human sense and a machine sense being integrated, becoming one, so technology does become a necessary part of evolution. In some ways perhaps it has affected how we've evolved anyway in a small way over the last two or three hundred years. Now it will really move things on. So, as a technologically oriented person, somebody involved with technology, it does start to make you 
um, quite powerful when it comes to the type of circuitry that you can design, the way that you can drive the technology forward, because effectively it's evolving humanity into cyborgs. You are directly affecting evolution. Well, I think that the important thing is not to ensure that the human species remain homogeneous forever. Uh, it could be a utopian future where the human species uh, spreads out and there are more different types of humans than there are now, ranging from uploaded humans to technologically enhanced humans to humans who just use a few simple technologies like vaccines and maybe memory enhancing drugs to ones that reject all of this altogether. The important thing is not that we're all the same, but that a future society is such that it embraces all these different kinds of humans. We shouldn't aim for homogeneity, but rather for a society which tolerates, celebrates and makes possible people um, to choose what kind of um, person they want to be. Whether that is an um, biologically natural person or somebody who uses technologies in different ways to transform themselves. But let's assume that there are humans that are against intelligent machines being given more decisions, of which there are some, and that there are certainly some humans that are against having implants, that are against becoming a cyborg and having extra abilities. Uh, it's difficult to see much of a positive future existence for them, that clearly the world is going to be dominated either by intelligent machines or cyborgs, or it combination, that, that's where the future's going. So the future for an ordinary everyday human, I, I guess there'll be some sort of subspecies, uh, just like we have cows now, um, so we'll have humans in the future. There'll be other creatures, other species, cyborgs, in, intelligent machines that are the dominant life forms on earth. And as a cyborg, if a, a human came to see me and it starts making silly noises, a bit like a cow does now, if a cow comes to me and says moo, 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 I, I'm not going to say, yeah, that's a great idea, I'm going to do what you tell me. So it will be with a human. They'll come in and start making these silly noises that we call speech and human language and so on. And I'll, oh, these trivial noises, I'm not going to do those silly things. Why should I? This creature is absolutely stupid in comparison to me. Technology, even here on the high street, though, is changing the game. For example, in the way that you pay for things. It's no longer just about cash and credit cards. These days, you can pay for things using your veins or even your heartbeats, as Jen Copestake has been finding out in Dublin. Markets have been trading in cash for thousands of years. But payment companies are moving towards creating a cashless society, and even one without PIN codes and passwords. So in a Christmas market, the easiest way to pay would be with cash. But in the future, you'll be able to come to a stall that you like, take an item, and just walk off. Thanks very much. <laughs> Bye now. That's the future envisioned by programmers at MasterCard's Innovation Labs in Dublin, where they're working to integrate payment and security technology into wearables. This includes NIMI, a biometric wristband that authenticates the user's identity by their unique heart rhythm. They're launching the world's first trial of a biometrically authenticated wearable payment solution in Canada, where only 10% of consumer transactions are made with cash. Unlike tap and pay, which doesn't require authentication to make a payment, this system uses persistent authentication. Once you put the band on, it reads your heart rhythm and keeps you authenticated until you take it off that uses your ECG or the electrical impulses of your heart to authenticate you. Your ECG is as unique as your fingerprint. You walk to your car, it automatically lets you in. You walk to the office, it lets you in. You go to your PC, it automatically logs you on. An ECG requires two contact points of the body. There's the two I contact see. points. Security and payment technology has become of urgent interest after huge breaches of consumer payment data, including at department store Target in 2013. Up to 40 million customers were exposed to malware on their credit and debit cards. But convenience is also important. Tap and go and contactless payment cards are becoming more popular, but as there's no authentication involved, payments are currently limited at £20 in the UK. 
Using a form of persistent authentication, like your heart rhythm, could allow transactions to go into the thousands. Other payment solutions are being tested here by MasterCard using the current smaller payment limit with wireless proximity beacons and wearables. Walk within the range of the beacon in this vending machine and you'll be asked if you'd like a drink. This yeah. vending machine happens to have a beacon right? and it's notified me on my smartwatch. Loading the details, it's going to give me the menu. So water would be great. Very healthy. Yeah. So I tap, I select my card. Watch. That is slightly spooky. Theoretically, the same beacon works the same way with Google Glass, but... Okay, Glass, vend water. I just got your destination is on the right. <laughs> I think it's my accent. Okay, Glass, vend water. Vend water. Your order is being dispensed. You can now collect from the vending machine. This doesn't seem so practical at the moment, as not many people are walking around wearing glass. And to make larger payments, you need to put on the wristband. Do you think people will wear multiple wearables? Because I don't see a lot of people necessarily wearing them at the moment. I think it really does come down to the utility that the wearables are providing. So ideally, you'd like to have all of the utility, the fitness tracking, the authentication, the health monitoring and so on, in a single wearable, make payments simpler, safer and smarter. We want to take the friction out of it, but we want to make sure that we continue to make them more and more secure. All of these things are being developed so that the payment happens seamlessly in the background and it's something that is just part of your everyday life and you should not have to worry about the payment piece of it. So the future is heading towards full biometric integration. People will just walk in a store, be told about products they like, pick up clothing and go with payment authenticated by your heartbeat as you leave the store. And you sort of sense a kind of almost like a religious awe almost. We could build gods if we wanted to. Here before us is a tremendous potential of benefit or of destruction, of good or of evil. Who will decide which it shall be? Well, one thing is certain, science alone can't decide it. The question will be decided by the people of the world, by you and by me. And the answer will depend upon what kind of people we are. Yes, science has given us a fearful and yet a very wonderful thing to use. How it is used will be determined by things hidden deep down in the hearts of men.